Terry, great job. Come here. Come here, come here, come here. Did Terry do a great job? Let's hear it for Terry. That, no. Now, now that, that's great applause. That's great applause. But we want to get it really fired up this afternoon, get it charged up, ready to go. Can anybody whistle? Now, don't hurt anybody's ears. Don't hear anybody's ears. But anybody whistle? Who can whistle? Wonderful. Who, all right. I gotta, I, who are they? Raise their hands. Raise their hands. And your name is? Lisa? Lisa. Very good. Who else can whistle like that? Because that was wonderful. Uh, very good. And your name is? Tina, Lisa and Tina are whistlers. Now, if you cannot whistle like Tina and Lisa, please raise your hand high and proud because this could be all for you. It's going to be all for you. Raise your hand high and proud. Since we can't whistle, we're going to go woof, 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 woof. I didn't even hear one woof. Now, okay, let's fire up here. Ready? Ready? One, two, three. Woof, 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 woof. Very good. If you don't want to do that, just applaud and go, yay, Terry. All three of those together, all three of those together, get it fired up, charged up, ready to go. So, you ready, Eric? All right, so here we go. So, Tina, Lisa, you ready to go? Very <laughs> you can do both. You can do both. All right, it's, it's my show. <laughs> I'm teasing you, Tina. All right, we're, we're still friends. I love your enthusiasm. We're there. All right, here we go. Ready, here we go. Did Terry do a great job? Let's hear it for her. One, two, three. Woof, 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 woof. you the best. Absolutely. Terry said it's all about me. I understand. I understand. I am excited to be here today, and I'm going to slide this over and hope I don't destroy it. But I am incredibly excited to be here today. I love talking about Harry Truman. And he thought independence was, in fact, the center of the universe. And he sounded to be his favorite hometown, hometown. And it's an incredible honor today to be able to offer some ideas from Harry Truman and what I've learned over the years and share some ideas with you. But he was actually a 17 to 1 underdog in the 1948 election. And you might ask, well, how do I know that? How do I come up with that data? Well, the way that we came up with that data is he was a 17 to 1 underdog because he was running against Tom Dewey in the election of 48. And people thought that Tom Dewey was a huge advantage. A matter of fact, Elmer Roper stopped polling six weeks before the election with the statement, there is no way Truman can make up the difference. There's absolutely no way he can make up the difference. And so he stopped polling. So then there were some pictures here, and this is his whistle stop tour. And while he was doing the whistle stop tour, you can see incredible throngs of people. So a gambler named Jimmy the Greek Snyder saw this, and he thought, you know, this might be an edge. A gambler is always looking for that edge. And the edge is, could I get a 50-50 bet but get huge odds on it? That's how we looked at it. He said, you know what? The prognosticators are saying Truman is really far behind, but Jimmy the Greek Snyder didn't believe he was that far behind. He saw these kinds of crowds, and he goes, there's no way this can be that much of a difference. So he looked at those, and he said, he asked himself, what does he see? What do you see? And he saw throngs of people. So Jimmy the Greek Snyder, he looked at the world differently, and he saw these two men. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody today that might have a mustache, but he asked the question of who would be the next president of the United States, not by asking people, who do you want to vote for? But he asked the question because Tom Dewey had a mustache. When Jimmy the Greek Snyder was a teenager and he was starting to grow facial hair, he was looking in the mirror, as many of us do as teenagers, and kind of admiring ourselves and, and growing into adulthood. And he was admiring himself, and he saw that he was growing some facial hair. And he said, hey, sis, he yelled in the other room. He yelled, said, hey, sis. I'm thinking about growing a mustache. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody here with a mustache, but she yelled back and she said, don't grow a mustache. Women don't trust men with mustaches. So he decided to test that theory. He saw a picture of both of them in a newspaper side by side. But rather than ask the question that most folks would do that, that are asking survey questions, they would ask, who do you, pre who do you prefer as president of the United States? Jimmy the Greek Snyder didn't do that. He hired three women to stand outside the A&P in Steuberville, Ohio. Back in those days, the A&P was the big grocery store chain. And he asked them to stand out in front of the A&P and ask other women, do you trust 
men with mustaches. They asked over 400 people. 327 women said they didn't trust men with mustaches, and about 137 said they did. 37 women said they didn't trust women with mustaches. <laughs> Needless to say, he had the data. He was relatively confident that he had what is known as the edge. And if he felt that Harry Truman had a 50-50% chance of winning, but he could get long odds on that, in the long run, if he continued to make bets like that in his career, he's going to be ahead. So he started to look around and see what, in fact, what are the odds he could get. And he found the odds. He found a bookie in New York that would give him 17 to 1 odds on the 1948 election. He took $10,000. He went to that bookie in New York and placed the bet. To give you a sense of the size of that bet, it was about equivalent to two and a half, maybe three homes at that time. Imagine putting your mortgage on the 2016 election. Now you're a little bit afraid, aren't you? Now you're a little bit afraid. Now you get a sense of what he did. So he went to New York, placed the bet, comes back. The rest is, in fact, history. We know that. Harry Truman won the election. Jimmy the Greek Snyder won $170,000. In those days, that was a huge sum of money. He then became very much like Harry Truman, he placed all of it on oil wells that all came up dry. And that's much like Harry Truman. Um, one of my favorite books of Harry Truman is by Robert Farrell, A Life. You know, there's been a number of biographies written on Truman, and, and all of them are, are excellent. Uh, Alonzo Hamby's A Man of the People is fantastic. It's about 800 pages or so, and it's excellent. McAuliffe's is a fantastic I call it uh, Valentine's the Truman. Uh, he really wasn't very critical of Truman. Whereas Robert Farrell was a man of his time, and he was more, uh, you know, showed the gloss as well as the bad spots of Truman. And one of the challenges, or one of the questions I always had is, why didn't Madge Wallace, Bess Wallace's mother, want Harry to marry, you know, for her daughter to, to marry Harry Truman? And it wasn't until I read Robert Farrell's book, I got a glimpse of that reason. And when you put it in perspective, it is, it's very powerful. Madge Wallace's husband committed suicide in the early 1900s. It was an incredible embarrassment to the point that they, she took the entire family to Colorado Springs and spent an entire year there after he passed away. Came back and she had to live with her family. If you can imagine being a mother of children and the embarrassment of having no income and having to live with your family in order to survive. And so she wanted a man that has the opportunity. She wanted to have a man who could, in fact, provide for her daughter. So Harry Truman, I'm convinced, was always looking after or looking for get-rich-quick schemes. He uh, owned a, an ore mine in Oklahoma. Uh, that went bust. We all know that he owned the haberdashery. That went bust. He was even involved in banking for a while, was never really successful there. He was also involved in a wildcatting operation in Kansas. And that was before World War I. They were drilling in Kansas, and the war effort broke out. So all the resources went from the war effort, or went from you know domestic production, oil wells, things like that, to the war effort. So they gave up on their wildcatting operation. And this is what makes Jimmy the Greek Snyder and Harry Truman much alike. Had Harry Truman and their wildcatting operation drilled 1,500 feet deeper, he would have been a multi-millionaire. It wasn't until after the war broke, they came back. One of the large oil companies drilled on the spots that they had the wildcatting operations, drilled 1,500 feet deeper, and found the largest oil pool in Kansas called the Teeter Pool. And he would have been a multi-millionaire, and we wouldn't have had a presidential library in independence. And I just find it remarkable about those two men and how their story is there. But he was always striving for something. And really, he didn't get involved in politics until it, he truly failed as a businessman. And it was really almost a last resort. How do I survive? How do I do this? And so he did that. So then, uh, of course, we all know that he won. 
and the, the iconic pictures that became Dewey versus, defeats Truman in the Chicago Tribune. A little bit of history on this, a little footnote on this. Um, the paper was actually selling for three cents that day. When the Chicago Tribune staff, uh, management, realized they'd made the mistake, they go, you know what, this will probably be a keepsake. And so rather than selling it for three cents in the morning, in the afternoon edition, they continued to have the headline, even though they knew it was wrong, and they sold it for four cents to try to make money on their mistake. Uh, and I thought that was a pretty creative approach to doing that. So let's talk a little bit about the leadership qualities of Harry Truman, because I truly find him a remarkable individual. I admire him on a whole host of levels. There's very rarely in my life that I've ever studied somebody as depth as I've studied Harry Truman and continue to admire him where the admiration continued to grow. Did he have faults? Absolutely. But you know the thing about Harry Truman is he never used the presidency for his own gain. When he came back from the presidency and he came back to independence, he didn't have a federal income. He didn't even have a federal pension. He had an army pension from World War I, and really, uh, they tell me it was like $148 a month. I mean, really no money at all. It wasn't Congress realized he had no pension that they passed a law in Congress to give him a $25,000 a year pension, and that's how he survived. That's how he and Best survived. He didn't actually own the home on Delaware until he wrote his memoirs. He sold the memoirs, and the money from that gave him the opportunity to finally own his own home. He never had, he never owned that home. Madge Wallace's uh, family owned it. And then, and then when she passed away, Bess took it and he uh, distributed the funds to the family members, which I thought was really, really remarkable. So I want to give you just some snapshots. Uh, I want to give you just some snapshots of Harry Truman. And there's basically four snapshots I want to look at of his life of transformational leadership. Because every one of us want to know how can we get better? How can we be a better leader? How can we make a more of an impact? How can we be more influential? We all ask ourselves those questions. We all ask ourselves those questions. And there's four pictures I want to paint for you right now. The first is the Pickwick Papers. That is not Charles Dickens' famous book. But it is about the agony that Harry Truman felt from being pressured by Tom Pendergast to do some things that were at the time considered to be corrupt. And he did not want to be involved in corruption. And he suffered tremendously from that. The next one is his picture of his swearing in and comparing and contrast the agony he felt and the pressure he felt from Tom Pendergast and how he accepted the oath of office after FDI, FDR passed away. I also want to give a snapshot of his early speaking experience and then how did he become Give em Hell Harry? I want to basically take those four pictures because I think that's important to take a, a snapshot of his life. And how can we learn about transformational leadership and how Harry Truman grew and changed because he did these things? So the Pickwick Hotel is right here. It's between 9th and 10th Street in Kansas City. It is now being renovated. It is still there. Uh, back in its heyday, though, it was a place to go. Harry Truman, because he felt tremendous pressure, and he couldn't tell anybody this. Being in political circles, he couldn't complain about Tom Pendergast and the pressure he felt because he might not be supported in his next position. So he felt tremendous pressure for this. And so what he would do is he would go to the hotel, and there's a picture on the left during the daylight, one at night. He would check himself into the hotel as a non-registered guest, which comes important, I think, when he goes to the Elms in 1948. And I'll make a comparison to that in a moment. But he checks in as a non-registered guest. Why would he do that? He didn't want anyone to know that he was there. They then kept these papers, and now they are in the library, and they refer to them affectionately as the Pickwick Papers. He would take the letterhead of the hotel, he would check himself in, and he would rant about the pressures he felt to the point where he was suffering from headaches, insomnia, GI tract issues. It was driving him crazy. How could he deal with this pressure? And many of us face those kinds of things in life. How do we deal with the pressure? Are we able to set it aside so that we're able to uh, uh, you know, pursue the opportunities in our life? So he struggled with that. And then what I do want to do is that's one snapshot. He had headaches and insomnia from the pressure he felt. And then I want to show you this picture right here. And this picture is where he's being sworn in at 712 uh, in the evening on April 12th, 1945. And you can see Bess is not happy. 
Uh, she did not want to be the first lady. Uh, matter of fact, there were many times when he was senator, she couldn't even go to Washington, D.C. She spent half the time here and half the time back in Washington, D.C. She hated the whole scene of the process. But right here, you can see him taking on the weight of the world. But the interesting quote is this. Remember the snapshot of the Pickwick Papers, the pressures he felt, the incredible burden he felt as, you know, probably a man in his 30s uh, in, in, in feeling and dealing with Tom Pendergast. Now he becomes the most powerful man in the world. And what does he say that night? Went to bed, went to sleep, and did not worry anymore. Now, if, I, if he were alive, I would ask him, how did you transform during that time frame? What did you do differently? How did you learn to give up all of that angst, that pressure, those concerns, and focus on the task at hand to be, and truly in my mind, he, and most historians will say, he's probably one of the top five to seven presidents of the United States. Truly transformational for a man who had only a high school education. He was not an uneducated man by any stretch of imagination, but he didn't have formal education. He was incredibly well-read, but he didn't have formal education. And one of the reasons, his father lost all of their money and all of their resources, uh, basically ga not gambling it away, he lost it in an options trading mistake. And he lost their farm, everything in Grandview and had to move to independence because of it. And that was right when he was a senior in high school, planning to go to college. He couldn't get in the military to get a degree that way. So he went to work at various odd jobs during that time frame. But I think that's remarkable. So look at the challenges that you're facing in your life. And many of us say sometimes they're overwhelming. And we may feel like we need to check ourselves into the Pickwick Hotel as a non-registered guest and do some ranting. And he did because he couldn't share it with anyone. But then years later, he realized what? Put it in perspective. You can only do what only you can do, but be the best you can be. And I think that's a remarkable image of that perspective. Then all you can do is all you can do, but all you can do is enough. And I think that's one of the messages of Harry Truman. So we're gonna talk about the early days of him speaking, and then how did he become Give Him Hell Harry? Another transformational moment. Now, some of you might know, or, or all of us may have the assumption that Harry Truman was always give him hell Harry. He could get up in the back of the Ferdinand Magellan and just give them the dickens about the do-nothing Congress prior to 1948. Because the Democrats had control of Congress up to 46. They lost control in 46, and when they took control, they wouldn't work with Truman at that time frame. So he basically labeled them the do, you know, the do nothing Congress. And he would give them hell at the back of the Ferdinand Magellan all over the United States in his whistle stop tour. Does anybody know when he became give him hell, Harry? Anybody know? Do you think it was in 44, 45, 46, 47, 48? What month in 48? See, the mistake that Harry Truman made is he tried not to be authentic. He tried to read, a, he tried to read speeches. He tried to read speeches like FDR. FDR had that melodic voice. He could read a text. He could write a speech and he could change a nation. He could give those fireside chats and inspire us all to a higher level of service. He was remarkable. Now, just think about being a, you know, a high school graduate. Now you're the president of the United States. You followed one of the greatest presidents of all time, truly beloved and followed. And now you've got to follow him and you've got this somewhat raspy voice, bad eyesight, and you can't read Go back to his early days. His very first speech was a gazebo in Lee Summit, Missouri. Reports tell me that he actually stood, he went up in front of the group, stood in front of the microphone, looked at the group, said a few things, and walked away. Many people would say that Harry Truman was an uninspiring and boring speaker. You would see, if I've got this, look how confident he looks there trying to read the text. Not very confident, right? 
How, look, how confident does he look right here? This is their major complaint of Harry Truman at the time. Basically, when he gave a speech, all you saw was the top of his head. Then the pressure arrived. He was going to have to run for president again on his own terms in 48, and he wanted to be elected president. And so his staff would give him speeches on a typewriter. He would try to read it, and he could never have the impact of an FDR. And they were wondering, can we, in fact, elect him as president with this shortcoming? Again, a transformational moment for Harry Truman. One day, he was giving a speech, and he had some note cards. And he could read, he could, he was incredibly well read, and he could take an idea, and he could talk extemporaneously from his heart. When you're talking from the heart, you don't need a teleprompter. And that was Harry Truman's moment. In April of 48, when he was starting the Whistle Stop Tour, they were making their first attempt to go across the country and just try this out. Uh, he was basically getting a degree at USC. His parents didn't pay for it. Oh, come on. Now, that's fun stuff there. I mean, they, you got to realize that's fun stuff there, isn't it? He, he got, you know, he was getting an honorary degree, and his parents didn't pay for it. I mean, I think that's fun stuff. Anyway, I shouldn't go there. Shouldn't go there, should I, Eric? Shouldn't go there. Anyway. Uh, so then in 48, here he is at the back of the Ferdinand Magellan doing the campaign. See, he's standing up straight. He's looking at the crowd. He's in fact, inspiring them. Dean Acheson, when he was working for Truman would actually go out into the crowds and to get people stirred up, he would yell out from the crowd, give him hell, Harry. And I just love that, that idea or that thought, but notice how he transformed when Harry Truman was under tremendous pressure, he found a way. That's what you've got to do in your life. When you're under tremendous pressure, find that pickwick moment, rant and rail, get that release, but then use that as the opportunity so that you can, can be in control of your life. That's what I love about Harry Truman. Also, Harry Truman loved to laugh. He kept General Vaughn, uh, Harry Vaughn, with him all the time. He met him in World War I. Harry Vaughn was very funny. And Harry Truman, I'm convinced, kept him around simply for his humor. One day they had to actually go out on a bridge and the French had given the United States four horses that were going to be on a bridge. And they were, had them all covered with, uh, uh, you know, uh, silk. So they would pull it off and, and, and you know, make the, the, the presentation. And Truman says to Harry, says, well, what should I do? What should I do? And Harry says, Harry, uh, Harry Vaughn says, well, as soon as they take the silk off, just go and they're off. <laughs> I love that. Harry Truman never said anything unkind about his mother-in-law, but he did. There's only one record that I found that he actually said anything unkind about a mother-in-law, and he told a mother-in-law joke. And with your permission, I'll tell it right here. Um, he was uh, talking on a campaign tour when he was running for Senate, and he told this on the campaign trail, and uh, it was about this guy who had lost his mother. And his mother had passed away. They're at the funeral home. The funeral director comes up to him and says, I'm sorry, we've only got one hearse today. We had two hearses, but the other one broke down. And would you mind riding with your mother-in-law to the gravesite? He says to him, wow, that's going to ruin my day, isn't it? <laughs> sorry, that's, that's a little flavor of that joke. Uh, but anyway, he, he, he never told, uh, oh, that's okay. I know that's dark humor. That's dark humor. But uh, also, Harry Truman had a sense of humor. He says, when a fellow tells me he's bipartisan, I know he's going to vote against me. And I think there's tremendous value in that. And he also said, give me a one-headed economist, because all the economists say on the one hand, but then on the other hand. And so he said, please give me a one-handed economist. And I love that about Harry Truman. But the other thing that I love about Harry Truman, even in the darkest moments, he smiled. Even when the chips are down, he smiled. Even when, in 1940, the chances of him being reelected to the Senate were very, very low. He says that was by far his most difficult election, much more difficult than the 48 election, even in 48 when they ran out of money in Oklahoma and actually had to have somebody wired in the money to keep the train rolling. I mean, can you imagine that? You're on a campaign, you're out of money, you've got to beg everybody you know to get enough money, $50,000, to keep the train rolling. Uh, but that wasn't his most difficult campaign. His most difficult campaign, he says, was the 1940 election 
but he was always smiling. And I think that was one of his characteristics of great leadership. So my question to you is, can you smile in those Pickwick moments? Can you smile when you're in fact sworn in on April 12th of 1945 and still smile and say, you know what? I'm going to go to bed tonight and not worry about it. Incredibly powerful ideas. So we know that he did in fact win the election, that he in fact became the Truman that we admire and we love. And we are lucky to have him as one of the most famous people of independence. And the reason that I'm proud of him is because, you know, I never have to make excuses for his character. And I think that's incredibly profound for us. A couple of things, I'll tell you a couple of things as I wrap up here. One of my favorite lines or favorite stories is by Margaret Truman out of her book about her dad called Truman. And she was at the home one day. And when he built the library and they lived on Delaware, he had no secret service until John Kennedy was assassinated. So people would actually walk up and knock on the door and say, we'd like to see Harry. Bess hated it. She just wanted to be a private citizen. She wanted to be out of the limelight. She didn't like that at all. And I completely understand her perspective. So she goes back to Harry and says, Harry, there's some folks that want to see you. And he says, oh, they don't want to see me. They want to see the president. He understood. See, some people who serve in public office think they become that office. Some people think they become president. You serve as president. And Harry Truman recognized that. You know, he went back and wrote about Mr. Citizen. And that's one of the reasons I admire him. He knew his role. And in my opinion, he was a great president, a remarkable individual with outstanding character. You didn't have to understand or, it, you know, he never monetized his position as president. When he left office, he could have been paid thousands on thousands of dollars to speak. He wouldn't do that. What did he do? He did it for free. If you pay my travel expenses, I'll do that. He could have been on boards of directors and taken care of his monetary issues and his, his money problems just like that. But he would say, they don't want me, they want the presidency of the United States, and that is not for me to sell. A remarkable individual to be able to have that kind of self-control in order to not monetize the position of president of the United States. And one of my favorite things is he had a sense of humor about himself, and this will be the last story I tell about Harry Truman. Um, he was, uh, there was a gentleman one day when they were at the house, and uh, this guy knocks on the door, has no idea who, where, who his house this is. His car broke down uh, in front of the house, and he needed a, a, a tow truck. And so back in those days, they had a cell phone, so he knocks on the door, and he says, uh, can I use the telephone? And Harry Truman says, well, sure, come on in. They gave him some coffee and let him use the phone. And they're chatting for a while, and they get done. And as they're done, uh, the guy goes, well, you know, I'm, I think I'm, I'll check, and I think the, the car will be out. I'm, I, but thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for your time, all of that. And he walks out, and Harry's at the door. The guy goes off the front steps on the house in Delaware, turns around and goes, do you know you look a lot like that SOB Harry Truman? <laughs> <laughs> and he told that story with pride. So those are the reasons I admire Harry Truman. I hope those are some of the reasons you admire Harry Truman. I hope I was, in fact, a good fill-in speaker. Uh, I did, in fact, trip Kay Barnes, and I was the cause of her injuries. <laughs> but I just wanted to get in front of the chamber meeting somehow, some way. Ta-da! <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you.